I'm here for the master class with Luca. I'm here to attend Samir Luca's master class to learn more about his skills of making films. It's always difficult to see yourself from outside, to not resist the process. Saying it, not me. I'm not saying this. <laughs> Please put your hands together for Luca Guadagnino. We're so happy to have you here because so many of us fell in love with Call Me By Your Name at Mami. It was screened here. It was screened here in 2017. And I have such a clear memory of this, okay? So I was sitting next to Anurag Kashyap, and I had this tray, and there was some food. And by the end of it, I was just weeping into it. And poor Anurag gave me a few minutes because he was like, let her recover. <laughs> <laughs> and then he realized he couldn't actually leave till I got my stuff together and kind of got up. And he eventually just held my elbow and very gently picked up that tray of food and got me out of the theater. And so I cannot thank you enough for that experience. Thank you. <laughs> Your films are just such a combination of really scavenging the human heart, really excavating our most complex emotions, our desires, our ideas about identity. And then you combine this with incredible visuals. Uh, Manola Dargis in the New York Times called you a cinematic sensualist. Do you like that? Um, first of all, thank you for your words. They're very, very reassuring. Um, it's always difficult to see yourself from outside. And um, often, more than not, film critics have helped me, even with their possible negative critiques understand what I do. So I can talk about uh, these uh, possibly because, because I, I now am at an age in which I can see retrospectively what I did, particularly through the help of uh, uh, people who can see your work and interpret it. Uh, it is true that uh, <clears throat> for me the idea of uh, self come with the idea of the uh, physical senses. Uh, at the same time, uh, as a person, I've always been very interested in the act of looking, the gaze. So one can argue that uh, the intertwinement between the, the act of looking and enjoyment through the gaze, let's say voyeurism, Bertolucci would say, and uh, uh, my profound interest in how people interact in the physical world make me somehow interested in sensuality and in the senses. Yes. I want to get a little sense of your creative process. Yeah. So you do so many things, right? Uh, there's, there's, of course, the features, there's documentaries, there's ads. Uh, how do you decide this is what I will give my life to for the next year? You know, George Miller said somewhere that um, at any given time, he has many ideas in his head, and then it's a Darwinian survival of the fittest. <laughs> is that how it works for you? I think that's super smart. I mean, George Miller is one of the great. I mean, I, I never heard that quote. It's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think there is something about that that I complete, completely relate to. When I was younger, I was more about uh, on a mission of making the things that I was worshipping within myself for a long time. Um, and then I realized that this effort was kind of fruitless, that uh, every time you wanted to put in motion against the tide that was given at that moment, you were going to succumb. And in fact, uh, once I started to uh, relax and find other ways of control that weren't about uh, the projects, but more about how you do the projects, uh, I started to make more. I started to find more um, corners where to look at and, and to tell stories that were not always the same, but at the same time, to be able to uh, um, somehow reflect on things that I have dear in me. So I would say now I am in a place where I get the circumstances to choose me. Um, what do you mean? I, meaning that I, I don't want to resist anymore 
uh, a process, you know, like uh, I remember when um, I was doing I Am Love, I was prepping I Am Love, and that was a, one of those projects that I was banging my head against the wall in order to make it happen. And it took me like six years to make it happen, and many dead ends, many times in which we lost the money, we lost the actors, we lost this, we lost that, and then, and I was like stubborn, 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 and, and eventually we made it. And I was in Milano, which is not where I originally come from, but where I'm living now. And I was there when a friend of mine called me and said, we have this book that we are going to turn into a movie. Can you read it for us? Because it's American, but it's set in Italy. And maybe you can tell us where it's set, because it doesn't say precisely. That book was Andres Asiman's Call Me By Your Name. And so I read the book, and I in, in understood that that setup set was Bordighera on the Ligurian, uh, I think Levant the coast, maybe Ponente, I don't remember if, which one is the two, but anyway, uh, on the border with France. And, and, and then a few months later, that version of the movie couldn't happen, and these producers started to ask me, would you do it, would you do it? And I said, no, 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 I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it. Because I didn't want to do another movie about rich people lounging on the sun uh, after I am love with a pool again. <laughs> and so I felt like, I don't want to be narrow there. Yeah. So I was saying, no, 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 many, many times. I think I said the first no, like f eight months after the first call happened to me. So I was asked to be a producer. I said, sure, I can produce. And then when all the roads were trying to make this movie happen and none of them was, was happening, and I was already prepping Suspiria, which is another of these projects that I wanted to make forever, I felt like, why not doing two movies in the same year like Fassbinder? And that's why I did it. And I was like, okay, I do it quickly. I, uh, I, well, let's do this little movie quickly. And I couldn't really predict that that movie that I was resisting so much was going to become a movie that was going to have such an impact to people. So it was a very strong lear lesson to learn, which means, again, to not resist the process and to let the thing to choose you. I read that you actually don't ever audition actors. You chat with them. And Up until a certain year, that I, was I was never uh, doing any auditions. But to be uh, right, I must admit that for a few of the last projects, I had to go through the process because we are, we are, they were very young uh, kids, mm -hmm. so we need to. We had to see, or uh, other circumstances brought me to the place where we had to do some auditions. But still, I feel that the only way you can really uh, trust an actor to be the character you want it to be, you must talk to them. Because I give for granted that an actor that I have the opportunity to meet has some technical skills. So they know? can act. They have to That's act. a given. Yeah, I give it for granted. And then what do you chat about that convinces you that they can deliver the performance? Or that they are the character? The, the more hidden their vanity, the better. <laughs> because <laughs> every actor is just a sort of like a machine of vanity, right? Which You're I like. You're saying it, not me. I'm not saying this. <laughs> you can agree with me. But I like, I like, I, I love actors. I love their personalities. I love their fragilities. I love the idea that the world collapses on them. I like that. <laughs> but you know, like they like to be looked at. at. Yes. And I like, I like to look at. So it's like, the, I feel completely safe because imagine that I am in now here and I start to look at someone with intention. This would be kind of embarrassing. But when you are on set, you look at people with intention and nobody can tell you anything. Yeah. And they want to be looked at. Yes. So it's good. It's a sort of like a given and take, like it's a BDSM relationship in a way. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think that, that but the, the, the superficial, frothy, immediate uh, vanity, that is a sign of running away from. Yeah. But so if you feel like someone really wants to uh, challenge them, themselves and have fun in the process, I think that's a marriage, and I like that. And you can sense this through the conversation. I have been lucky, because now it's... Uh, my first feature film was uh, The Protagonist, which was shot in 1998, so we're nearing, uh, I think, 25 years. And in 25 years, I must really honestly count on one hand, and not all, 
uh, difficult actors that I work with. Wow. And I work with many. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, I was very, very lucky. And even the difficult ones, it's fun to work with because eventually the more you grow up, the more you become like, you know, like, okay, uh, you can deal with that, you know, and have yeah. a little fun. But, you know, I've heard a lot of people who direct or act say that they can only work with people they love or at least like and they want to be in the company off for the next year. Is that a thing for you? I think that's quite accurate. That's quite accurate. Yeah. I mean, like, Suspiria was an incredible experience because I had probably 50 actresses or performers yeah. between all the great actors and all the great dancers. And uh, they were so different from one another, from generation. Like, you, went, you were going from Mia Goth and Dakota Johnson to, uh, yeah, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to through Tilda all the way to uh, the great actress from Fassbinder, which, oh my God, this slips my mind. Ingrid Cavan. Right. So when you meet all these personalities that come from so different realm of the world, it's fantastic and it's fun. Spoke about Bertolucci, who of course is a massive influence on your cinema. You made a documentary on him. Now you said that his view was that the camera is a tool that really excavates and looks into the soul of the actor. And so films are not just stories, but they're actually documentaries of the actor. I, I, I yes, yeah, he said that. What, what does this mean? I think it means that the baggage of actor is not necessarily technical. Of course, they, there are many of them who knows the ropes, when to turn, how to look up, and stuff like that. But mostly, these people have to analyze themselves in order to unearth what they can read through the text and in the relationship with the actor they have in front and the director and the camera and the environment. So in a way, they are free in the circumstances of shooting to play a note that comes from their own instrument. So that's necessarily a form of self-expression of self. Mm. It's not just hiding behind the character. It's actually being like a criminal in plain sight as a character. So you're unearthing something from that's inside think, of you. I think they unearth something. Yes, yeah. And I'm there to let them be as candid as possible to unearth them. And then we sh you film it and you appreciate it, and you build around that, uh, but then when you go to the editing room, which is the most Im Im fascinating of all the phases of making a movie, you start to see, like that the little piece of paper that you put an acid a liquid and surface as a color, you see more than what you saw when you were shooting. Stuff start to come out, and you can see all the uh, 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 honesty, uh, artistry, commitment that these people have put on their performances. Yeah. You said that you like editing the best in I all do. the phases. Why? Because I'm alone with my editor and I don't have to answer like a hundred questions a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and I, 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 usually I control the environment. So it's a nice place with a nice uh, 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 chair. It's not a place that is uh, uncomfortable. You are at the mercy of whatever you g given condition when you shoot a movie, <laughs> right? I shot the movie, in last movie I did is called Queer, from yeah. William Burroughs' second unpublished novel, then published uh, 35 years later. And I said, let's shoot it on stage, completely on stage, in Cinecittà, wow, I'm going to be in control. No. <laughs> what happened? I mean, it was raining all the time, so we had to stop the building of the sets and moving from place to place, and then heat was terrible, and then one day cold was terrible, and too much. Tell me about the <laughs> editing. Uh, you're there with your editor. Yes. Do you have him or her first do a first cut and you're completely removed from it? No. No? You're there fully micromanaging? No, 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 no. <laughs> no. I think you have to find ways to micromanage people without letting them understand that you're micromanaging them. <laughs> that's, that's the, the art secret. of the director, right? That's the art. Manipulation <laughs> at, the, at the utmost level. Yes, yes. And, that, and then sound like a nice person. <laughs> uh, How do you get distance from the movie? You know, when you do a movie, you have different tasks. One is to make sure that you deliver what people is paying for. 
I feel that I have a great responsibility for that. To the producer, you mean? To the financiers okay. or the studio. Sure. I'm producing my movies with great producers together with them. So our, our but also to, to the actors involved, to the people that help making the movie. That is a very important rela uh, relationship and, 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 and duty you have, yeah. responsibility. So that when you go back to the editing room and you are separated from the process of filming, which is a very big bubble, but yeah. it's a bubble. I would never claim that any of the time they spent on set could be considered my life. I think that's a suspension of life, where maybe you can really be obsessive and obsessed. So when you are out of it, you can see it from distance already, because you can see where you were. Yeah. And that helps a lot. In a lot of your films, you're looking, your characters are, in some way, outsiders, underdogs. Emma and I am love, Harry in A Bigger Splash, Elio in um, Call Me By Your Name, Susie in Suspiria, Lee, of course, in Bones and All. What about the underdog keeps you coming back to that? I think the underdog is the most powerful person. How? Because they, ha they don't have really the need to belong to the status quo. They can make their own status quo. Mm. Uh, they are really uh, forceful people. I've been always drawn by them. People who can be considered um, like uh, uh, utterly different. And I'm not talking about identity necessarily. I, I, I mean, I care and I don't care about that, honestly. I'm, I'm more talking about really being like really relentless individual. Um, like not uh, wanting to be excluded, but actually not wanting to be part of anything, but by being and feeling what they are. And you can see that in many different shades in life, I guess, but also in the movies, like Elio is uh, an underdog in that he really cannot resist to listen to the way his desires makes an impulse to him to be. We don't know what Elio really will end up feeling and being as a person, as an adult. You know, the visuals though, and you, you talked about how it's, it is so much the physical senses, the sensuality of it. I feel that the pain and the devastation that some of your characters go through is heightened because it's so beautiful? Well, I think that uh, it's unavoidable pain, right? Mm. I think that uh, every movie that I love uh, deals with that. Uh, and so even the joyful ones, like Singing in the Rain, um, I think that if I have learned that as a person, and, uh, and if I learned as a filmmaker to um, tell the story of this painful process of being, I, I feel lucky because I, I, I kind of hopefully try to go to the essence of things. Yeah. What's the most important quality for a director to have? To be incredibly presumptuous and absolutely realist. <laughs> These two things are super important. One without the other would create, in the first case, a sort of a delusional director who thinks he's doing something that he's not or they are not doing. And the realists uh, that, uh, them, themselves are a shooter, so they can be hired by Marvel. Uh, <laughs> but someone can be both, should be both. Because when you make a movie, you can't really believe that you are playing with the ideas of what the movie means and never steer away from the goal, which is to complete the shooting in the first place, which means dealing with many people for many different topics in many different ways. So that needs a strategist. That needs uh, someone who has a kind of military um, mindset. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you have to be very presumptuous or visionary about yourself, delusional somehow, to think that you might do a movie. Yeah. That someone will show up and watch what you do. That you can kind of like pretend to com involve a number of people to do something that it's only in your mind completely. Those two things are the qualities, I would say. 
I like the idea of sense of humor for filmmakers, uh, but I don't think that's a sort of like mandatory quality. You have some very serious directors who are very good and uh, love people. I think if you love people, you can be uh, a humanist and you can tell stories. Yeah. There are many filmmakers who do not love people who are very sophisticated filmmakers and you can watch their movies with, in awe of the brilliance. But at the end of the day, when you eventually realize that you were lacking the human warmth, you have seen a spectacle that might be sterile. I will not name names, though. <laughs> Luca, does cinema have to have a moral imperative or is it enough to provide pleasure and joy and laughter? So to answer your question, I think yes. It has to be political, it has to be thoughtful, it has to be uh, provocative and also it has to be completely pleasurable. I want to talk about that actually because uh, you, you said that cinema does not work to an exact set of parameters like math or chemistry or physics. Um, you said we're dealing with the unconscious yeah. and we have to let that be cunning. I love that line. It's, the Chinese says that cinema is electric dreams, right, Marco? Electric shadow, shadows, yeah. still. Which is, which is so beautiful. And, and you said if we trade the unconscious for an algorithm, we will fail. Now, so many of our lives right now are frankly, being touched or run by algorithms, yeah. right? Uh, so many of us are watching things suggested to us by algorithms. I don't know, how do you feel about contemporary if, situations? If, if a topic like that uh, would have not uh, uh, banalized by mainstream communication where we can all talk about algorithm, I would be in awe of the concept because it's something scientific, I am interested, what is it about? But now we all talk about algorithm as if we know what it is. <laughs> I have, I'm 52, and so I dealt with the producers, financiers, studios for, f for a long time now. And algorithm or no algorithm, you meet very smart people or very stupid people. And the percentage is like 20 to 80 in favor of the stupid ones. <laughs> Before the algorithm, and now that there is the algorithm. So it's all about understanding how to deal with stupid people yeah. and allying yourself with the very smart ones. Even if you are dealing with the algorithm. Mm -hmm. That's what I think it is. So the fundamental doesn't change? No. No, no, no. I don't think it changes. Also, I'm not in the business of, uh, uh, of the repetition. I hope that I do the mold, but then, then when they start to use the mold to do copies, I'm gone. Mm. So I don't do copies. I try, even though I, do, I did two remakes. I, I hope we can say that those are not copies. You said that your motto is, if somebody asks you something twice, you should just say yes. <laughs> yes. How does this work? It worked a few times, not with the people I wanted in the past, but maybe in the future, we'll see. Literally do this. I do believe. Why? Well, I mean, like, uh, it's Tennessee Williams who said, I relate to the kindness of strangers, right? So if you're kind enough to ask in a kind way, why can you say not? You should say yes. I mean, in, with certain parameters. <laughs> <laughs> the countryside. Is this where you do the gardening? Because you said that is another passion. That's my real ambition. To be a gardener. To be a gardener. You said it teaches you patience and endeavor. Absolutely. I, f I put some hydrangea in my garden and I was mad at everybody because after five months, those poor plants were like pieces of rubble on the floor. I said, well, that's awful, what's that? And everybody was looking at me, people who knew gardening was like, hmm, poor guy. A year later, those are huge and beautiful, and I had so many beautiful flowers. Mm -hmm. So patience, attendance, waiting, yeah. It's all useful information for a director as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. Don't rush things. Yeah, yeah. Okay, one last question and I'll open it up to the public. Uh, Luca, what gives you hope for cinema? Uh, watching great movies that I have not seen, 
part both classic films. I think I get hope from. I, I have never seen a movie that I now hail as one of my favorites, which is Betty by Claude Chabrol from uh, Simenon. Mm -hmm. I saw it last year because I had a coffret, like a box set of Chabrol, and I had missed some of them, including Betty. And that movie was so thunderous, such an incredible directing feature. Incredible, like I am in awe of that movie. So the idea that I can be surprised this way by a movie of 25 years ago from a director that unfortunately is no longer with an incredible star who is no longer Marie Trintignant, that was like a thunderous moment for me. I don't think cinema is necessarily on a sort of chronology that goes from the past to the future. I think even a movie like Betty by Chabrol belongs to the future. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> no, oh, I just wanted to ask, in all these years, from the late 90s till now, has there been a day when you've fallen out of love with what you do? Every day I'm set, I hate my job. <laughs> really? Oh yes, I really am uncomfortable. Why? Because it is difficult, because you know what you need to achieve, and it's all about going against the tide. Mm. It's like being a surfer, but instead of surfing on the tide, you have to find, kind of jump the tide, and then sharks are below. It's so difficult, and so like emotionally dangerous. And then you make the movie, you distance yourself from the movie, and you happen to have the privilege of meeting an audience, whether it's like this today, all these wonderful people, or when you meet someone that tells you why they see themselves in something you do, and then you feel the power of what you do and the responsibility for it. And you fall back in love. Yeah, <laughs> I do. How lovely, thank you. Um, okay, we can take questions. Uh, do you have any thoughts on like the future of cinema as a format? There are days in which I think it's going to become like opera. So very rarefied and expensive for very few people. And this pessimistic thought uh, disappears when I see that people gather to theaters, actually. Mm -hmm. So we once have to resist the kind of banality of feeling pessimistic. I have met the great director Franco Maresco many, many years ago when I was 15. So almost 40 years ago in Palermo. And Franco, who not only is a great director and a sort of uh, anarchist, uh, um, he is a great cinephile. He gave me the first Jean Renoir to look at in VHS. He gave me Boudou Sauveur Peloso uh, when I was 15, and I saw that. And, and he was telling me, cinema is dead, cinema is dead. It is an ongoing thing. I think cinema is dead probably since the advent of the of sound <laughs> yeah no theoretically i would say yes um i wanted to ask you in films like call me by your name and bones and all which come from novels um is it easier for you to set a slower and more um open pacing for a film rather than a film that you're writing by yourself and if so how do you pace those films and those characters working from a source material gives greater control and also the pleasure of betraying the source material. We actually did not betray William Burroughs, mm. but the novel was, is incomplete. So we had to figure out how he would have completed it. Uh, so maybe that's where the betrayal lies, but I hope not. Um, uh, the pace, I think the movie, the movie calls for the pace. You know, like it's like the movie Challengers, uh, which unfortunately has to be postponed to next year. It's, it's a romantic comedy about friendship and, and love in tennis world. And it's, the rhythm is the, the tennis matches. That's the brilliancy of Justin Kuritska's wonderful script. And, and everybody act and behave by the rhythm of being like these kind of energized tennis players. Yeah. But also it's a very, I mean, it's, I, I th it's interesting because I feel the movie is quite hectic and yet it's very relaxed. So I feel like pace, it's really what the story needs it to be. Um, I Am Love, which was screened here, right? Yeah. 
was um, uh, an original story, which is not so original, a woman who betrays the husband for the best friend of the son. <laughs> I mean, illicit uh, adultery. It's uh, as old as uh, society, right? Yeah. Um, but that movie was like, I mean, remember, the first cut was like the first, before the chef shows up was like an hour. <laughs> so like, no, I think I like, I, like, I like slow pace because it helps you seep into the characters. I think editing is a very difficult thing. And I think editing is something that is wrongly used in the majority of cases. When on editing, like uh, pace is traded for speed, you are missing so much of the characters that you are kind of left in a sort of state of confusion, an emotional confusion, if you do not let the character grow on screen. Um, that's one of the things that I really feel disconnected by many of the contemporary films I see. Does it though, Luca? Do you when when you're editing and and you are dealing with how long pauses should hold, how long scenes should hold? Do you do you um, st sort of struggle with that? That everyone's attention spans are now shorter and shorter. And what should I do? Do you have those conversations? I have two answers for that. One is Scorsese said once that when he's editing, he resists the pleasure of cutting where he feels is the right moment. That's Thelma Schumacher who tell, told him. He, they wait, and they pass boredom to go to intensity. So sometimes it needs longer. The second uh, answer is that what I do, particularly before I, I cut, I, I lock a picture, I'm privileged because my movies are my, the movies I want. They have never traded with like, a test screening or uh, producer cut. No, my cut is the, the film. But I show the movie to very different people at the same time, secretly for one another. And when someone tells me, oh, I love the first part, the second part you need to work, and the other one says, I love the second part, but you need to work on the first part, we know we have a good movie in our hands. <laughs> That's fabulous. It's true, it happened many times. Really? Oh my God, call me by your name. Like, I got this thing. I said, okay, we don't change anything. <laughs> when do you worry though? Is it when too many people say the same thing? Well, if someone insists on something, then you have to be uh, listening to that. Right. I would say, yes. And you are But also it's very difficult because like, very few people understand the power of being shown a movie that is not finished. Mm and not to become like a sort of uh, reality show judge, but someone who can think of things and really give you a serious advice. Yeah, yeah. I had two questions. One of them was in Call Me By Your Name, you ended with a long 10 minute close of scene of Timothy just crying. Like the camera is still and the screen is just showing Timothy crying. What made you choose that scene to end it because it's so long? And at the same time, what did you brief Timothy for that? Because it's one of the greatest scenes I've seen and what a great performance by Timothy. The, the novel, Andre's novel continues. After Elio and Oliver Summer finishes, it goes on and on for another 40 pages and, and basically tells the story of how, what happens in years to come. So we, we didn't want to go there. And so for me, I felt like that we had to stay with Elio's shock of realizing the illusion of his feelings. The, let's say, you know, I think the summer of, of I'm not fishing for, uh, because I'm in India, but the summer of Elio is like a, is like a mandala. And then it needs to be wiped out. He learns the hard lesson of that. He is truthful. He is honest in a way, right? Oliver is not. Oliver is hiding and he has been, he has been kind of uh, 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 dismantling this mandala they built from the gate going. But Elio didn't know that because he, he didn't know that, that such a thing could exist in relationship, right? Because it, when he meets uh, Marcia, he's very direct with her. Yeah. So that is a very, very important moment. I think the movie becomes the movie there. So it was very important that we could actually see that in him, hopefully mirror 
our experiences in his experience and be in the position of the fire, which is very cinematic. We is the POV of the fire. Um, we are the fire. And, um, uh, you know, like, that was the previous to the last day of shooting. The experience of shooting that movie became increasingly more and more pleasurable for all of us. More and more um, kind of an experience that we were feeling we were going to, to hold with our hearts forever. And also for Timothy, who was 19, who was leading the movie, being in every single shot of the movie was like an important thing for him. So he was very like shaken by that. We were all a bit shaken. There was a thunderstorm coming. Everybody was very quiet. And, I, and the great Sufjan Stevens had sent us the song, uh, Visions of Gideon, already a few months ago, like two months before, a few months before. And so uh, we put the headphones in, 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 Elio, in, uh, in um, Timothy's ears. And I didn't say anything. We just, let's shoot. We did three takes. And I think the last one, which is the third we used. Such a beautiful scene. <laughs> Such a beautiful scene. Uh, I'm a filmmaker, and you are one of my favorite filmmakers of all time. Thank you. And um, so I have to ask, uh, all your films have seen, and there is this word that associ I associate with your films. It's visceral. All your films are so visceral, and it, it's like a thing of the heart. And um, how, do you, how do you get the visceral out of your actors? And sometimes the story itself is very visceral, and sometimes the acting is so visceral, be it uh, Tilda in I Am Love, which is one of my favorite films, and uh, Timothy in Call Me By Your Name, or even Dakota in uh, Suspiria. Like, such a visceral acting she has done. Is it from the relationship that you build with your actors that this visceralness come? Or um, I guess I'm asking you a trade secret. I don't know. <laughs> well, there is no secret. It's really the relationship, I guess. It's the text. It's the script. It's great script. It's great story. I think it's the ambition. Like we, The good thing is that when you gather people together to do a movie, you do it in the, play, in the feeling of trying to be ambitious of doing something that might remain, might. Um, so everybody is motivated by uh, a sort of excess, a beautiful excess, you know? Um, also, it's like, some, I mean, challengers, uh, Zendaya, she's fantastic, Mike Fife, Josh O'Connor, they're fantastic in the movie, and they became those tennis players. You believe that those people are like legitimate, amazing tennis players. In order to do that, they, they learn tennis, they build their bodies. Already to do the process, it's something that makes, like, like, they, like the, the, the decision of, of being in front of the camera very strong uh, in the process, you know? I think you probably, probably, I would say, make everybody enthusiast and make them all this wishful to, to, to push their limits. Nice. Thank you. Ah. Thank you, everyone, and big applause. Thank you. This is so nice. Thank, Thank you. you.